Chapter 43 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 43 Olaf Haraldsson or Olaf the Saint. Olaf Haraldsson, son of King Harald Grenska and Asta, descended from Harald Horfagra. His father died before he was born, and Asta was married a second time to King Sigurd Sir of Ringerike, where Olaf was raised. The people of this fertile inland district had taken little part in the Viking expeditions, but they dwelt near the centers of trade in southern Norway, and the new ideas and elements of culture which trade and commerce brought from foreign lands were easily accessible. Ringerike and the neighboring districts, like Hadeland and Toten, became at this time a center of culture, which is still evidenced by the many decorated runestones which were erected here during this period. Two of the finest specimens are the Dina stone from Hadeland, and the stone in Alstad and Toten. These districts were also making great progress economically. King Sigurd Sir, who seems to have been a peaceful man of no great ability, was more devoted to farming than to military exploits. But Asta was a high-minded and ambitious woman, who wished her sons to gain power and renown. Her words to her son Olaf are characteristic. If I had the choice, I would rather that you become over-king of Norway, that you should live no longer in the kingdom than did Olaf Tryggvason than that you should become no greater king than Sigurd Seer and die of old age. The sagas state that when Olaf was three years old, Olaf Tryggvason visited Ringerike, and Sigurd Seer, Osta, and Olaf were baptized. But according to the Norman chronicles and the Catholic legends, he was baptized much later at Rouen. Alexander Buga thinks that the saga statement may be true, since the boy was called Olaf, a name not before found in the family. Olaf was still very young when he went on Viking expeditions together with his foster father, Rane Vidfirle. They went first to Denmark, where they joined some Viking bands in a descent on the shores of Sweden and Finland. On their return, they visited Jomsborg, where Thorkel the Tall, a brother of Sigvald the Jarl, was preparing an expedition to England. Olaf joined Thorkel's forces, and they sailed southward along the coast of Jutland. After a battle at Sundvik, they proceeded to the coast of Friesland and Holland. Thiel, an important commercial town, was sacked and burned, and the suburbs of Utrecht were plundered. 1008 or 1009. From Holland, Thorkel sailed for England, and arrived there in August 1009. After Olaf Tryggvason had concluded peace with King Ethelred, and had returned to Norway in 995, Svein Sjugesheg of Denmark continued military operations against England. In 997 and the following years, the southern districts were continually ravaged by Viking bands. A number of Danes and Norsemen had settled in England, and Ethelred feared that they might make common cause with the invaders. His fear and cowardice led him to secretly arrange a general massacre of the Danes, which was carried out on St. Bryce's Day, November 12, 1002. How far the slaughter extended is not known, but it must have been confined to southern England, where the Danish settlers were few. This event again brought King Svein to England with a large fleet in 1003. A war began which ended in the final conquest of England. King Ethelred fled to Normandy, and Sven was hailed as King of England in 1013. During these ten years, the war had been continuous, but in 1009, when the fleet of Thorkel the Tall arrived, Sven was not in England, and it is possible that the fleet had been sent with his aid and approval. At Southwark, they made a fortified camp but failed in an attempt to take London. The next year, they ravaged the country extensively and defeated Ulf Kiljarl and the East Anglians at Ringmir, and King Ethelred was forced to promise them a tribute of 48,000 pounds of silver. In 1011, the Vikings besieged Canterbury. Through treachery, they gained entrance to the city and they carried away, among numerous other captives, Archbishop Elfi, who had confirmed King Olaf Tryggvason. They held him for a ransom, but as neither this nor the Dane Geld granted by Ethelred was paid, they stoned the unfortunate archbishop to death. He was buried in St. Paul's Church at London and became one of the most venerated of English saints. The Danegeld was finally paid and the Viking army gradually disbanded. Thorkel the Tall and Olaf Haraldsson entered the service of King Ethelred with 45 ships. They defended London against King Sven in 1013 and made such brave resistance that he failed to take the city. But after Ethelred had fled, and all England had been subjugated, London also submitted to King Sven. In this way, Olaf Haraldsson had been schooled in the art of war, and had lived through a period of youthful storm and stress. 
He had seen the wildest king of Viking warfare in company with the professional buccaneers of the Jomsborg, but he had also come into direct touch with European life and ideas in Friesland, Holland, Normandy, and England. What impression this had made on him we do not know. He was still a Viking, but nobler thoughts and higher ideas soon made him turn away from the adventurous path of rude Viking warfare. The spirit of Christianity and the charms of a new and better culture inspired him with the ambition to devote his life to the attainment of higher aims. The lost cause of Christianity and national unity in Norway was still waiting for a leader strong enough to break the evil spell which had fallen upon it. To wrest the leadership in national affairs from the unwilling hands of a strong and reactionary aristocracy, and to launch the nation upon a period of national development in compact with new ideas, was the great end to which destiny seems to have consecrated the life, the heroic courage, and singular devotion of this remarkable prince. King Sven died suddenly in 1014, and his oldest son Harald succeeded him as king of Denmark. But the Anglo-Saxons recalled King Ethelred and his son Edmund Ironside and Sven's son Canute, later called Canute the Great, who was in East Anglia, was forced to leave the country. In 1015 he returned with a large fleet. Thorkel the Tall had now joined him, and he had also called to his assistance Eric Jarl of Norway. Some hard campaigns were fought with the English forces led by Edmund Ironside, but King Ethelred and Edmund both died in 1016. Canute became king of England and married Emma of Normandy, King Ethelred's widow. Olaf Haraldson left England in 1013 in company with King Ethelred, and went to Normandy to aid Duke Richard II in a war against Count Odo of Chartres. He accompanied Ethelred back to England, but left again shortly after on an expedition to France and Spain. He sailed southward along the coast of France, fought a battle with William V of Aquitaine, and then proceeded to the northern coast of Spain, where he captured Gunvaldsborg, and took Jarl Gerfen prisoner and forced him to pay a ransom. He seems also to have visited Portugal and southern Spain. The saga tells us that Olaf sailed into Gudelskiver, Karl Sarna, but while he was lying there waiting for favorable wind to sail into the Strait of Gibraltar, Norvasund, and thence to the Holy Land, he dreamed that a strange and powerful but also fearful man appeared and bade him give up the plan of going into foreign lands. Go back, he said, to your Odal, for you shall become king of Norway forever. This is, of course, a legend, but Olaf returned to Normandy, where he was well received. He spent the winter in Rouen, where he is said to have been baptized, but it is probable that he was confirmed here by Archbishop Robert, a brother of Duke Richard. In the spring of 1015, Olaf sailed from Normandy to England, and thence to Norway, where he would take up the struggle to re-establish Christianity and to regain the throne of his ancestors. He had only two merchant vessels, about 140 men, and a few missionaries. The moment was opportune. Eric Jarl had gone to England to aid King Canute, and had left his son Hawken in charge of his possessions at home. The two merchant vessels which arrived from England created no suspicion. Hawken was at this time in Vestlanda with only one war vessel, and Olaf entrapped him and took him prisoner. He was liberated on the condition that he should leave the country and never again bear arms against Olaf. Hawken went to England where his uncle King Canute made him Jarl of Worcestershire. Eric Jarl was made ruler of Northumbria, where he died in 1023. Olaf sailed southward along the coast of Normandy, entered the Foldenfjord, Christiania Fjord, and came to his stepfather, King Sigurd Seer, in the autumn. He was now about 22 years of age. He was of middle size, but strong and well-built, with auburn hair, red beard, and ruddy cheeks. He had large, bright eyes and a majestic look, the saga says that he was well skilled in all manly sports, but it does not state that he surpassed others in this respect. In speech he was wise and eloquent. He lacked, however, the charm of personality and the chivalric qualities which had made Olaf Tryggvason so popular. He was less cheerful, less willing to compromise, at times he was irritable and unnecessarily obstinate. But he possessed the resolute will and singleness of purpose which accomplishes great things. He had a strength of character and an ability to sacrifice all for a lofty aim, which makes him a great and tragic figure in history. Olaf acquainted King Sigurd with his plans, and received his promise of support. By rich presence and persuasion he gained many friends and adherents in Oplanene, and Sigurd Seer gave him all possible aid. The saga says that Sigurd held a meeting with the other kings of Oplanene in Hadeland, where Olaf was present. He urged upon them the necessity of throwing off the foreign yoke which the Swedes and Danes had laid upon them. They could now get a man who could take the lead in this affair, 
and he told them of Olaf Haraldsson's many exploits. King Rerik of Hedemarken expressed his regret that Harald Horfagra's kingdom had fallen to decay, but they were well satisfied, he said, with the present arrangement. The overkings were now so far away that they did not oppress them. It was doubtful if their condition would be better if a native prince became overking of Norway. They yielded, however, to persuasion, and Olaf was proclaimed king of Norway at a general thing assembled in Oplandene. The powerful Dale Gudbrand, Herse and Gudbrandsdal, also pledged him his allegiance. In the winter before Christmas, Olaf crossed the Dovra Mountains and surprised Sven Jarl, who was dwelt at Stenkjar in Trendelagen. Sven had to flee, and Olaf seized the food which he had prepared for the Christmas feast. He also advanced to Nidaros and began to restore the buildings of the deserted town. Here he met the skald Sigfat Thorsen, who had just arrived from Iceland. Sigfat became Olaf's herd skald and his lifelong friend and companion. But Svein Jarl and Einar Tambarskjelver soon appeared on the scene with a large force, and Olaf had to return to Oplanena. He now went to Viken, where he drove away the Danish officials. It appears that these districts submitted without offering any resistance, but a decisive combat would yet have to be fought with the powerful Svein Jarl, and both prepared for the inevitable struggle. In the spring of 1016, Olaf sailed through the Foldenfjord, Christiania Fjord, to meet Svein, who was approaching with a large fleet, and on Palm Sunday they met at Nesjar near Tunsberg, where Sven was defeated after a sanguinary battle. He fled to Sweden and died on an expedition to Russia the following year. The Battle of Nesjar marks the final overthrow of the rule of Jarls in Norway. Olaf, who was now master of the whole realm, went to Trøndelagen, where he was proclaimed king of Norway at the Urething, according to old custom. End of chapter 43「Chapter 44 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershit. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 44 – Foreign Relations Olaf had ascended the throne of his ancestors, and Norway was again a united kingdom. But the kings of Sweden and Denmark, who since the fall of Olaf Tryggvason had exercised sovereign authority in the country, had not recognized its integrity or independence. The situation was extremely difficult. The powerful nobles at home might seize the first opportunity to join King Olaf's enemies, as Eric Jarl and Sven had done in the days of Olaf Tryggvason. And such an opportunity was sure to come, since Olaf would have to defend his kingdom against his powerful neighbors, who now claimed it with some show of right. The king of Sweden sent tax collectors into Trøndelagen as before, and held Jemtland and Renrique, which he had seized. King Olaf refused to pay him taxes and prepared for war. At the Sarp Falls on the Gloman River in southeastern Norway, he erected a walled fortress called Borg, later Sarpsborg, inside of which he founded a city and built a church to St. Mary. The ruins of the fortification are still visible. Olaf gathered stores at Borg, or Sarpsborg, and remained there during the winter of 1017 to 1018. He carried on secret negotiations with the people of Ranrique, and as the chieftains gave him their support, the province soon renewed its old allegiance to Norway. Olaf advanced with an army, drove out the Swedish officials, and war began along the border. Ragnvald Ulfsson, Jarl of Vestergotland, who was married to Olaf Tryggvason's sister Ingebjörg, felt himself bound to King Olaf through this bond of relationship, and became his faithful friend. Olaf and Ragnvald agreed that peace should be maintained between them, and as the war was unpopular on both sides of the border, Olaf sent an embassy to the Swedish king to negotiate peace. In the spring of 1018, a thing was held at Uppsala, where Ragnvald Jarl was present and urged the king to conclude peace with King Olaf. The powerful Torgny Lagmund also arose and spoke in favor of peace with such authority that the king yielded. The agreement was made that the king of Sweden should give Olaf his daughter Ingegerd in marriage, and that the wedding should be celebrated at Konghela in the fall. But Olaf Skotkonung did not keep his word. He married his daughter to Grand Duke Yaroslav of Gardarike, Russia, and when King Olaf came to Konghela to celebrate his nuptials, the bride did not arrive. Olaf was very angry and wished to renew the war, but he was finally persuaded to send another embassy to Sweden. Sigvat Skald was entrusted with the mission. He came to Ragnvald Jarl, where he saw the beautiful Astrid, another daughter of the Swedish king, and Ragnvald undertook to arrange a match between her and King Olaf. He took the princess to Sarpsborg, where she was married to Olaf without her father's consent. Olaf Skotkoning of Sweden would probably have continued the war, 
but circumstances forced him to make peace with Olaf Haraldsson. King Canute, who ruled all England, had also been chosen king of Denmark on the death of his brother Harald. And he might seize Norway, and possibly also Sweden, unless some balance of power was maintained. The Swedish king, therefore, met Olaf at Konghella, where peace was concluded 1019. The independence of Norway was recognized, and the borders were fixed between the two kingdoms. End of chapter 44《ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハルソン・ハル He introduced Christianity in Oplanena. He visited every district and petty kingdom, placed missionaries there to instruct the people, and punished severely all those who refused to accept the Christian faith. The kings of these districts were much displeased, and assembled to form an alliance against him, but a friend informed him of their plot. He surprised them and took them prisoners while they were still deliberating upon the uprising, and punished them severely. Some he banished, others he maimed or blinded, says the saga. The rule of petty kings in Norway was ended. Oplanena, which hitherto had been nearly independent, was now placed immediately under the crown. After the treaty of peace with Sweden in 1019, Olaf could devote himself to the missionary work with greater energy, and he was ably assisted by the bishops which he had brought from England and Normandy. Of those mentioned, Rudolf, Bernhard, Grimkel, and Sigurd, Grimkel was the most important. He was a man of learning, tact, and ability. The name indicates that he was of Norse descent, but he must have been born in England. He was King Olaf's chief advisor and assistant both in the missionary work and in law-giving. Among the king's most powerful and devoted friends were also Bjorn Stalera, Komas Stabuli, Sigvat Thordsen, the great skald, Thord Folesen, Aslak Fitjeskala, Thormod Kolbrunner Skald, and Hjalte Shegeson. In 1019, Olaf went to Nidaros, where he remained that winter. The following summer, he introduced Christianity in Hologaland, the most northern district of Norway, and Harak of Tjalta and Thora Hund of Bjarki, the most powerful chieftains in those parts, pledged their submission to the king. In Uttrundelagen, Christianity had been maintained since the days of Olaf Tryggvason, but in Intrundelagen, the people had returned to paganism, and the powerful Ulve of Ega continued to officiate as priest in the heathen temple in spite of King Olaf's warning. Olaf, therefore, marched against the Intrunders while they were assembled for the spring sacrifices, captured Olve, and caused him to be executed. He gave his widow and his estates to Kalv Arneson, whom he made a Lendermand. The people of Gudbrandsdal were converted to Christianity in 1021, after some resistance. When the army which they sent against the king was defeated at Bredevangen, south of Sel, a thing was assembled at Huntorp, where the Hersa Dale Gudbrand was baptized, and the people accepted Christianity. Dalla Gudbrand built the church at Huntorp, and Olaf left missionaries to instruct the people. The story told in the sagas that the people carried out an idol representing the god Thor, thinking that it would frighten King Olaf, and that Kolbein the Strong, one of Olaf's men, demolished it with a club, is a piece of fiction introduced by Snorra for dramatic effect. It symbolizes the combat of Christianity against heathenism, and King Olaf's war against the idols. It marks the beginning of a whole literature of folktales connected with the name of St. Olaf. In 1023, Olaf also introduced Christianity in the Gulathingslag and in Valdres. In many places, as in Viken, in Untrandelagen, and in localities on the west coast where churches had been built by Olaf Tryggvason, Christianity had not altogether disappeared, but it had been obscured and corrupted through heathen ideas and customs. It therefore became King Olaf's second great task to give the Church of Norway a permanent organization, and to establish for it a code of church laws according to which it might be governed. With the assistance of Bishop Grimkel and other ecclesiastics, 
he produced such a code of laws written in the Norwegian language. The Heimskringla says, The church laws he made according to the advice of Bishop Grimkel and other teachers, and devoted all his energy to eradicate heathenism and old customs which he considered contrary to the Christian spirit. He called a general thing in the island of Moster, where people from Viken, Gulathingslag, and Frostathingslag were present. Here, King Olaf and Bishop Grimkel explained the new laws to the people, and they were finally adopted. For the Eidsivathingslag, Olaf made a new code in which the church laws were incorporated. The districts of Viken were also organized into a thinglag, called Borgarthingslag, because the thing met at Borg or Sarpsborg. It received a code of laws to which the church laws were also added. It is not certain, however, that the Borgarthingslag was originally organized by King Olaf. In the Gulathingslag and Frostathingslag, there was one principal church in each filka. In the Borgarthingslag, two, and in the Eidsivathingslag, three. The principal churches had resident priests who received the income from church lands set aside for their maintenance. The final step taken by King Olaf in the organization of the Church of Norway was to place it under the higher ecclesiastical authority of an archbishop. This might have led to a closer affiliation with the Church of England, since Christianity had been brought to Norway from that country, but the political situation proved unfavorable. Knut the Great, who was now King of England, had not relinquished his claim on Norway, and any closer relations between the two countries, even in religious matters, might have contributed to strengthen his hold. King Olaf, therefore, sent Bishop Grimkel to negotiate with Archbishop Unven of Bremen, with the result that the Church of Norway was placed under the supervision of the Archbishop of Bremen. Christianity began henceforth to gain general favor. The old pagan conceptions were not eradicated, however, through the hasty conversion. They gradually assumed Christian forms and continued to live in the religious life as well as in the songs and stories of the people. Christ was substituted for Odin as the divine ruler. The poet Eilif Gudrunson sang about Christ the mighty king of Rome, who sits in the south at the well of Urd and rules over the lands of the mountain kings. King Olaf takes the place of Thor as the red-bearded champion of light, who is ever victorious in his war against trolls and evil spirits. Freya reappears as the Virgin Mary, who rules over the animals of the forest. She is also the midwife and assists at the birth of children. This naive but poetic blending of Christian forms and pagan ideas marks the advent of the intellectual life of the Christian Middle Ages, from which the folk songs and fairy tales have sprung. It became necessary for Olaf also to revise the civil laws, to bring them into closer conformity with Christian principles. The Heimskring law states that he made the laws according to the counsel of the wisest men. He took away or added as he considered it just. We have already seen that he gave the Eidsivathingslag a new code, and it is probable, though not certain, that he established the Borgerthingslag. The laws of the Gulathingslag and of the Frostathingslag were so thoroughly revised that these old codes were henceforth known as the laws of St. Olaf. The revision of the laws by the king and his learned assistants, who were familiar not only with Christian principles, but also with the laws of the Christian kingdoms of Western Europe, was a legal work of the greatest importance. The laws of St. Olaf were destined to become the foundation of future Norwegian jurisprudence. King Olaf's law-giving represents in itself a centralization of power, and a growth of royal authority which carries with it the greatest change in the political institutions of Norway. King Haakon the Good had indeed been a lawgiver, but not to the extent which this function was now exercised by King Olaf. The old laws were regarded as having been by the gods themselves. They were inherited, time-honored custom, the expression of the sense of legal justice of the whole people, who originally had exercised the power of law-making. But after the union of Norway and the introduction of Christianity, when the laws had to be revised and brought into harmony with the new conditions, the king gradually assumed this power. And after Olaf Haraldsson's time, the people had little direct influence on legislation. The old log things, which had been suited to the old tribal organizations, were conspicuously defective as lawmaking assemblies for the United Kingdom of Norway. They were four in number, not a single assembly for the whole country, and they were provincial, not national in character. They had no power of taxation, and the laws were introduced by the king, or in his name. The powers of administration, taxes, and legislation were therefore quite naturally united in the hands of the sovereign. The king, not the log things, became the exponent of the national will. But he was not an absolute monarch. The people still exercised indirectly no small influence on legislation. If they desired a new law, or the revision of an old one, they negotiated privately with the king and when an understanding was reached, the measure was proposed at the log thing in the king's name. 
If he wished to propose a new law, he negotiated with men of influence to gain the necessary support. In these preliminary negotiations, the people could exercise considerable influence through their spokesmen. To become a law, the new measure had to be proposed at the log thing and accepted by the people. In matters of taxation, the king was also dependent on the will of the people. If new taxes had to be levied, even for special emergencies, a proposal was brought before the various local or filkes things, where the assent of the people had to be secured. The establishment of the Kingdom of Norway based on the theory of a strong national monarchy with centralized legislative and administrative powers necessitated many important changes in the whole system of government. Many new departures of far-reaching importance had been made, especially by Harald Horfagra, and Olaf Haraldsson continued his great predecessor's work of organization. The Herser, or tribal chieftains, who had ruled over larger local districts, were now replaced by Lendermaind, equals men holding lands from the king, or officials appointed by the king. The Herser had been the leaders of the people, an old aristocracy. The Lendermaind became the representatives and adherents of the king. The Ormaind, who in Harald Horfagra's time were men of humble station, appointed as overseers of the royal estates, were now replaced by Sisselmind, or royal officials. They collected the taxes in their districts, and arrested and punished criminals in the name of the king. The herd was also reorganized. Three classes are mentioned. Herdmind, Gester, and Huskerlar. The Herdmind, usually sons of Lendermind and other leading men in the country, constituted the king's court. The Gester were sent on difficult and dangerous missions, and executed the police duties exercised by the king throughout the kingdom. The Huskerlar had charge of the work about the royal residence, and furnished the necessaries for the king's household. This class does not seem to have belonged to the herd proper. The king's mirror says, All men who serve the king are called Huskerlar, but honor and power are divided among them according to their ability to serve him, and according as he wishes to grant preferments to each. There are some Huskerlar in the king's herd who receive no salary, neither are they permitted to eat or drink with the rest of the herd. They must do all things about the royal residence which the overseer demands. They seem to have been young men of good family who sought this kind of service as a possible road to promotion and royal favor. At the head of the herd stood the great officials of the king's court, who acted in the capacity of ministers of state. They were called Hertzjarar, leaders of the herd. The chief officials were the Stellari, who had charge of the royal equipages, and acted as the king's representative at the thing, the Merkismather, or royal standard-bearer, the Fjehirthar, or treasurer, and the herd bishop, who was the king's advisor in ecclesiastical affairs. All public offices, from the lowest to the highest, had thus been organized into an articulate system of national administration. During the reign of Eric Jarl and Sven, the powerful chieftains in the colonies had cast off all allegiance to Norway and ruled as independent princes. The task of reuniting these island possessions with the kingdom required, therefore, the most vigilant attention. Through energetic and tactful measures, King Olaf soon succeeded in bringing the Orkney and Shetland Islands back to their old allegiance. The Faroe Islands accepted the king's code of church laws, but so long as the crafty Trondigata lived, no taxes were paid to the king of Norway. King Olaf investigated diligently how Christianity was maintained in Iceland. He persuaded the Icelanders to abolish many heathen customs which were still practiced, but his church laws do not seem to have been established there. He sought to gain the friendship of the Icelandic chieftains, and many of them visited him in Norway. He negotiated with them in regard to the relation between Norway and Iceland, and an agreement was made about 1022, called the Institutions and Laws which King Olaf gave the Icelanders. According to this agreement, the Icelanders should virtually enjoy the rights and privileges of citizens of Norway. They had the same right of Odal as other freeholders, and could inherit property in Norway on the same terms as native citizens. They paid no taxes except the Landere, which was paid for the privilege of trade and intercourse with Norway. In return, the king's men should have the same rights in Iceland as native citizens, and the suits at law should be brought directly to the highest court. In time of war, the Icelanders who happened to be in Norway owed the king military service, and could not leave the country. Two out of every three would then have to join the royal standards. This arrangement lasted till 1262, when Iceland was finally united with Norway. King Olaf rebuilt the city of Nidaros, which Olaf Tryggvason had founded, and restored the royal hall and the St. Clemens Church, which had been erected in Olaf Tryggvason's time. More difficult than any other task in King Olaf's great work of reorganization was that of reducing the recalcitrant aristocracy to proper submission. Many of the great chieftains who reluctantly had pledged the king in nominal allegiance soon manifested a hostile opposition to his plans, 
but King Olaf nonetheless proceeded with characteristic energy to restrict their power to what he considered reasonable limits. The powerful Harek of Tjotta had to divide his sissel with King Olaf's friend Osmund Grankelson, and Oslak Fitjaskala was made sisselmend in Hordaland in southwestern Norway, where Erling Schalgson of Sola ruled with almost royal power. The king enforced the laws with strict impartiality, and punished with uncompromising severity even the most powerful offenders. The Heimskringla says, He meted out the same punishment to the powerful and to the small, but the great men of the country regarded this as arrogance, and they were greatly offended when they lost their kinsmen through the king's just decision, even if the case was true. This was the cause of the uprising of the great men against King Olaf, that they could not tolerate his justice. But he would rather surrender his kingdom than his uprightness. Erling Schalgson and others sent their sons to King Canute the Great in England, who received them well, gave them rich presents, and did what he could to encourage the defection of the Norwegian chieftains. King Canute was a powerful monarch who ruled over England, Scotland, Wales, and Denmark. He also called himself King of Norway and claimed even the throne of Sweden. He was tall and stately, with light hair and bright eyes, generous and sociable, a king whom the young nobles loved to serve. So long as Canute was fully occupied with affairs in England, the aristocracy did not venture to rebel openly against King Olaf, but the growing power and influence of King Canute was a steadily growing menace to Norwegian independence. The new king of Sweden, Anud Jakob, was a brother of Olaf's queen, Astrid. The two kings made a joint attack on Denmark in an endeavor to seize the country, but King Canute met them with a large fleet, and an undecisive battle was brought by Helgia, near Skåne, after which all thought of conquering Denmark had to be abandoned. Erling Schalgson and Horik of Tjotta had thrown off all allegiance to King Olaf, so that he could find no support in northern and western Norway. King Canute, who had made active preparations to invade the country, left England with a fleet of fifty ships in 1028, and a Danish fleet lay ready to join him. When this news reached Norway, the chieftains of Trundelagen assembled the Orething and proclaimed Canute king, and Erling Schalgson hastened to his assistance at the earliest opportunity. But Olaf would still strike a blow for his throne in his country. He left Viken with thirteen ships, and met Erling Schalgson's squadron near Utstin in southwestern Norway. A battle was fought which resulted in the defeat and death of Erling. It was now late in the fall, and a great fleet was advancing against him from Trindelagen. All further resistance was useless. He steered his ships into a fjord in Sindmer, took leave of his friends, and through the winter's snow he made his way across the mountains to Sweden. He spent some time in the island of Gothland, where he introduced Christianity. From there he proceeded to Novgorod, and finally to Kiev, where he found refuge at the court of his brother-in-law, Duke Yaroslav of Gardarike. End of chapter 45「Chapter 46 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 46 Norway under Danish Overlordship, the Battle of Stiklestad, King Olaf the Saint. King Knut the Great, who was now over King of Norway, placed Hakon, the son of Eric Jarl, in charge of the kingdom as his deputy or vassal. Hakon went to England, where he married Gunhild, a daughter of King Knut's sister. But on his return voyage he was drowned in the Pentlandsfjord, and the great Lodi Jarl family became extinct in the male line. Both Kalv Arneson and Einar Tambarskjeller aspired to become his successor, but Knut let them understand that he intended to make his own son king of Norway. This was a great disappointment to his ambitious nobles. It became apparent that the benefit which they were to derive from their rebellion against King Olaf would be considerably smaller than they had been led to anticipate. Einar Tambarskjelver became quite disgusted and remained absent from Norway till after the Battle of Stiklestad. King Haraldson languished in exile at Grand Duke Yaroslav's court. He was moody and unhappy, and could never wholly relinquish the idea of rescuing Norway from foreign rule. The Heimskringla states that Olaf Tryggvason appeared before him in his dreams, and told him to return to Norway and claim the kingdom which God had given him. It makes a king renowned to gain victory over his enemies but it is a glorious death to fall on the battlefield with one's men. Many of Olaf's men had joined him in Gardarike, and they encouraged him to attempt to wrest Norway from the foreign conquerors. When the news spread that Hakon was dead, he determined to return to Norway. He left his son Magnus at the court of Jaroslav, and proceeded to Sweden, where King Anund Jakob gave him great aid, though he did not dare to form an alliance with him against King Knut. 
He gave him a number of soldiers and allowed him to recruit many more. His adherents in the eastern districts of Norway also aided him. His half-brother, Harald Sigurdsson, son of King Sigurdstyr and Osta, the later chieftain of the Varangians in Mikkelgard, Constantinople, joined him with a force of 720 men. People of all sorts drifted to his standards, and he was able to enter Norway with a considerable army. He had some good troops, but the greater portion of these hasty levies were of inferior quality. In Trindelagen, the chieftains, on hearing of King Olaf's return, had gathered a large army of the best forces in the country under such able generals as Kalv Arneson, Tora Hund, and Horak of Tjota. Kalv Arneson had the chief command. The Heimskringla states that their army numbered 12,000 men, while Olaf had only 3,600 men. But these figures are no doubt too large. Henrik Mathieson estimates the forces of the chieftains to have numbered about 5,000 men. Siegfot Skald says that they gained the victory because they had twice as many men as King Olaf, who accordingly must have had a force of about 2,500 men. Olaf marched across the mountains to Verdalen, in Trundelagen, and selected a very advantageous position at Stiklestad. According to the Olaf saga in Helga, he remained here a few days before the arrival of the chieftains and their forces, waiting for Dog Ringson, who was bringing reinforcements. But Dog reached Stiklestad too late to be of any assistance. On the morning before the battle, legend tells, while the army was still resting, King Olaf fell asleep, leaning his head upon the knee of Finn Arneson, Kalv Arneson's brother, who had remained faithful to him. He dreamed that a ladder reached from the earth to heaven, and that he had reached the highest round. Here Christ stood and beckoned to him, and promised him reward for his faithful work. At noon, on July 29, 1030, the two armies faced each other on the field of Stiklestad in full battle array. King Olaf stood in the midst of his army in Brini and Gild Helmet. He carried the sword Hneter, and a white shield on which a golden cross was painted. His white standard with a dragon in the center was carried by his standard-bearer, Thord Folison. About one o'clock, the war trumpet sounded the signal for advance. The serried columns of warriors rushed down the sloping ground to the combat. The most notable battle in Norwegian history had begun. Olaf's plan was to throw his opponents into disorder by a vigorous assault, and in this he was partly successful. The lines in his front yielded before the furious onset, and great confusion resulted. But the experienced generals and well-disciplined forces of the enemy soon regained their foothold. Olaf's small army was outflanked and surrounded, attacked in front and rear, and overwhelmed by superior numbers. The king was soon wounded in the melee. He had dropped his sword and stood leaning against a stone when Kalv Arneson and Torahund, who pressed forward toward the royal standard, found him and cut him down. Thord Fullison, the standard-bearer, Bjorn Stalera, and many other leading men of the royal army were now dead, and many were wounded. Among the latter were Thormod Kolbrunerskald, who in the morning of the battle had awakened King Olaf's army with a song. He withdrew from the conflict with an arrow in his bosom and died before evening. Dog Ringsung now arrived and made a spirited attack, but he could not prevent the complete rout of the royal forces. Those who could sought safety in flight, among others Harald Sigurdsson, who was severely wounded. After his recovery, Harald went to Russia to Grand Duke Yaroslav, and later he proceeded to Constantinople, where he became captain of the Varangians in the service of the Greek emperor. Christianity was no longer the issue in the Battle of Stiklestad. The Christian faith had been so firmly established that the chieftains did not attempt, and probably did not even desire, to subvert it. The memorable battle was a struggle between the old system of aristocratic rule and the new royalty leagued with the ideas of national union, independence, and progress towards higher cultural ideals. For this cause King Olaf had labored, and in devotion to it he gave his life. But the aristocracy had triumphed. The king lay dead on the field of battle, and the national cause seemed hopelessly lost when the rumor got abroad that Olaf was a saint. The glory of his martyrdom emanating from the Battle of Stiklestad kindled the first sparks of patriotism, and gave the lost national cause a new and sacred consecration. Those who had opposed Olaf the king now willingly bent the knee before Olaf the saint. His name became the rallying cry of patriots. His great work and still greater sacrifice for his high ideals had united all hearts. His defeat at Stiklestad had turned into a national victory. An English lady, Elfgifu, Norse Elfiva, bore King Knut a son, Sven, who was now about fourteen years of age. Sven was made viceroy in Norway, and his mother accompanied him, acting as his advisor, though it is generally acknowledged that she was the real ruler during Sven's short reign. 
The old form of aristocratic government was not re-established as might have been expected. King Canute was not satisfied with maintaining merely a nominal overlordship, as Harold Gormson had done in earlier days, but demanded for his son powers and privileges far exceeding those which King Olaf had claimed. Sven and Alfiva established Danish laws, and began to rule as if they were exercising unlimited dominion over a conquered people, though it was the Norwegian nobles and not the Danes who had defeated King Olaf. No one was permitted to leave the country without permission from the king. The property of persons convicted of murder was confiscated by the king, and the inheritance of persons outlawed for crime was swept into the royal coffers. The fishermen had to give a part of their catch to the king. A tax called Christmas gifts was levied, all ships leaving Norwegian harbors had to pay a tax called Landura, and the people had to erect all buildings needed on the royal estates. Each seventh man had to do military service, and the testimony of a Dane, a member of the king's herd, was to be worth that of ten Norsemen. King Canute's failure to keep his promise to the Norwegian nobles had caused great disappointment, but the government which he established added insult to injury, and awakened the bitterest resentment even among the chieftains who had given him the kingdom. King Olaf, who had fought so bravely for national independence, was contrasted with the foreign oppressors. His justice and heroism were extolled, and the deep mutterings of popular discontent soon grew into angry avowals that disloyalty to him was treason, and that slavery under foreign rulers had been substituted for national independence. The rumor that King Olaf was a saint added new strength to the growing storm of discontent. The eclipse which occurred on August 31st, a month after the Battle of Stiklestad, was thought to be in some way connected with King Olaf's defeat and death, and the association of ideas soon established the conviction that the eclipse took place at the time of the battle. Miracles were said to have happened while the king's body was lying on the battlefield. Thorgils Hamason and his son Grim, who were living near Stiklestad, saw on the night after the battle a light issue from the place where the king's body was lying. They carried the corpse away and hid it carefully from his enemies, but the same light was seen every night. King Olaf's cheeks did not fade, but retained their ruddy color. His hair, beard, and fingernails continued to grow, and sick persons who prayed to the dead king were healed. King Sven and his mother made every effort to hush down and explain away these stories about Olaf, but this only nursed the wrath of the people against their enemies of their patriotic and sainted king. The disappointed nobles supported the growing opposition to the Danes. It was Einar Tambarskjelver's boast that he had not taken part in the uprising against King Olaf. He remembered that King Canute had promised him a jarldom in Norway, and that he had not kept his word. Einar was the first of the chieftains to maintain that King Olaf was a saint. Olaf's body was brought to Nidaros and interred in the St. Clement's Church, which he had built. Bishop Grimkel proclaimed him a saint, and the 29th of July, the day of his death, was dedicated as a church holiday, the Olafmas, in his honor. A pretender by the name of Tryggve now appeared, who claimed to be a son of Olaf Tryggveson. He came to Norway with a small force, but was defeated and slain by Sven. But the powerful Lendermain gave the king no support. They summoned a thing at Nidaros, where the people presented their complaints, but Sven and his mother were unable to give any answer. Einar Tambarskjelver arose and said, Go home, ye people. A bad errand you have now, as you have had before when you appealed to Alfiva and King Sven. You might as well await injustice at home as to seek it all at once in this one place. Now you listen to the words of a woman, but you refuse to listen to King Olaf, who was in truth a saint. A vile treason was committed against him, and our punishment has been severe, while such great humiliation has fallen on our people since this rule was established over them. God grant that it may not last long. It has already lasted too long. King Sven and his mother tried in vain to assemble a new thing. No one came in answer to their summons. They began to fear a general uprising, and in the winter, 1033 to 1034, they left Nidaros, and Danish dominion in Norway was ended. The people of Trindelagen determined to place St. Olaf's son Magnus on the throne. Einar Tambarskjelver and Kalv Arneson were sent to Garderike as special envoys to offer him the crown. He accompanied them to Norway, and was proclaimed king in 1034 or 1035. Olaf's canonization was an event of the greatest importance, not only because of the immediate results which it produced, but also through the influence which St. Olaf was destined to exercise on the religious and national development in the future. The hero king and great lawgiver had become the patron saint and supreme representative of the nation. The perpetuous rex Norwegiae, under whose aegis both royalty and hierarchy could henceforth exercise permanent and unquestioned authority. 
The old church still standing at Stiklestad was built, it is thought, on the very spot where King Olaf fell, and the rock near which he suffered death is said to have been enclosed in the altar of the church. But Nidaros, where the king was buried, became the chief St. Olaf sanctuary in Norway, and pilgrims from many lands visited the saint's grave every year. They came from Sweden, Denmark, and Russia, from the Baltic Sea countries, and from the British Isles. In course of time, their rich offerings to the saint enabled the Archbishop of Norway to erect a cathedral in Trondheim, the most magnificent in the Scandinavian north. Crosses and chapels were erected in various places made sacred by Olaf, but the commemoration of the saint spread also to other countries, and many churches were dedicated to him in foreign lands. In the island of Gothland, in Ongermanland, Helsingland, Uppsala, and other districts in Sweden, he was especially honored. There were St. Olaf churches in Norrköping, in Lødøse, and the monasteries in Åbo, Strängnes, Skara, and Enköping were dedicated to him. In Denmark, the commemoration of St. Olaf was very widespread, which can be seen from the number of churches dedicated to him in all parts of the Danish kingdom. In England, a number of churches were named in his honor. In London alone, there were four St. Olaf churches, one in Southwark, one in Silver Street, and two in the eastern part of the city. There was also a Tule, equals St. Olaf Street, and Exeter had a St. Olaf Church. Chester has still an Olaf's Church and an Olaf Street. York has an Olaf's Church, and Norfolk is St. Olaf's Bridge. Churches were also dedicated to St. Olaf in Rival in Estonia, in Novgorod and Constantinople, and there is evidence that he was commemorated also in Ireland, Scotland, and Normandy. End of chapter 46「Chapter 47 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Kjershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 47. Magnus the Good, the Union of Norway and Denmark. Magnus Olafsson met with no resistance on his arrival in Norway. King Knut the Great died in England in 1035, and Sven and Alfiva, Elfkifu, fled to Denmark, where Sven died the year following. What plans King Knut had with regard to the succession is not known but it is probable that he desired his realm to remain united under his one legitimate son, Hardeknut, son of Emma, who had already been crowned king of Denmark. But Harald Harefoot, the son of Knut and his English mistress Alfiva, the mother of Sven, was staying in England, and when Knut died he became an active candidate for the throne. Hardeknut was, therefore, compelled to come to an understanding with King Magnus. In order to terminate the hostilities between Norway and Denmark, which had already been in progress for some time, the two kings met at Brennerne, near the mouth of the Goethe River, in 1038, and concluded a treaty of peace. Hardeknut recognized the independence of Norway, and a compact was entered into by the kings that if one of them died without an heir, the other should inherit his kingdom, and twelve leading men of each country took an oath to maintain the compact. The Treaty of Brennerne is a counterpart of the Treaty of Konghella, concluded with Sweden in 1019. The integrity and independence of Norway had now been duly recognized, and the kings of the Ingling dynasty were regarded as possessing the same full legitimacy as the royal families of Denmark and Sweden. King Olaf's great fame both as king and saint had made a deep impression on the whole Scandinavian north, and contributed greatly to win for Norway an unqualified recognition as a sovereign and independent state. When Magnus returned to Trondheim, says the saga, he placed King Olaf's body in a beautiful casket ornamented with gold, silver, and precious stones. He also began the erection of a St. Olaf's church, in which the remains of the saint were to be deposited, but this structure was not completed till in the next reign. Before Magnus became king, he had to promise full amnesty to those who had taken part in the armed opposition to his father. It seems that he also agreed to abrogate the noxious laws introduced by King Sven, and to re-establish the laws of King Olaf. But youthful impetuosity soon led him to deal harshly with his father's old enemies. When Harek of Tjota was killed by a personal enemy, the offender was not punished. Tora Hund died on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and Karl Varniston had to flee to the Orkneys to Thorfinn Jarl, who was married to Ingebjörg, the daughter of his brother Finn Arneson. There had been much secret rivalry between Kalv and Einar Tamboskjöller, both of whom had aspired to become Jarl. Einar, who had taken no part in the uprising against King Olaf, gained the friendship of Magnus, but the young king was unable to forgive Kalv, who had been the leader of the opposition to his father. Einar was styled the king's foster father, or chief counselor, and exercised great influence. Many who had taken part in the battle of Stiklestad against Olaf were made to feel the king's wrath, 
and the laws of Sven were not repealed as quickly as had been expected. The people grew dissatisfied, and chose as their spokesman the skald Sigfant Thordson, who had been King Olaf's closest friend, and who now occupied a similar position of honor and confidence at the court of King Magnus. In a song called Bersuglisviser, the skald reminded the young king of his promises to the people, showed him how ill it befits a king to break his word, and pointed to the growing dissatisfaction and the danger of such a situation. So deeply was Magnus impressed with the song that he immediately changed his ways. He became so just and kind that the people henceforth called him Magnus the Good. He granted amnesty to all, and promised to improve the laws by gradually revoking the more oppressive measures of King Sven's reign. The ties which united the island colonies with the mother country were weakened by the repeated overthrow of the government, as well as by the establishing of foreign dominion in Norway. As the Danish kings paid little attention to the Norwegian colonies, the jarls and chieftains who ruled over the island groups found opportunity to make themselves independent. In the Orkneys, Thorfinn Jarl had regained his old independence after the fall of St. Olaf, and the crafty and powerful Trondigatha had ruled the Faroe Islands according to his own pleasure since the death of Sigmund Brestesson. But when Trond died in 1035, Leif Asserson, another Faroe chieftain, went to Norway and tendered his submission to King Magnus, who placed him in charge of the colony. Thereby, Norwegian sovereignty was again established in the Faroe Islands. The king's measures with regard to the Orkneys proved less successful. It has been noted elsewhere that on the death of Sigurd Ludvison, the Orkneys were divided among his sons Sumerlide, Ruse, and Einar, but none of them lived long, and their half-brother Thorfinn Sigurdsson became Jarl, and seized all their possessions. Bruce's son, Ragnvald, who was staying at the court of Grand Duke Jaroslav in Gordovike, had accompanied Magnus to Norway. Magnus gave him the title of Jarl and granted him his father's possessions in these islands. Ragnvald was well received by Thorfinn, who at this time was engaged in wars in Scotland. He granted him two-thirds of the islands, and they became friends and allies. But while Karl Harnesson, the uncle of Thorfinn's wife Ingebjörg, was staying in the Orkneys, Thorfinn and Ragnvald became enemies, and hostilities resulted in which Ragnvald lost his life. The colony did not return to its allegiance to Norway till in 1066, in the reign of Harald Hordrada. King Knut the Great is thought to have been about forty years old at the time of his death. He came to England as a conqueror, but proved to be one of the ablest and wisest of English kings. During the last five years of his reign he ruled over a great empire including England and Scotland, Denmark, Norway, the Orkney Islands, and the Viking colonies in the Hebrides and the Isle of Man. The extensive possessions under his own immediate rule he governed with a wisdom and moderation which entitles him to be numbered with the greatest monarchs. He did not confiscate the people's lands for the benefit of his own followers, or in other ways treat England as a conquered country. His soldiers received a money payment, and the people were allowed to keep their lands. He established the old English laws, known as the laws of Edward the Confessor, and ruled as a native English sovereign. He was one of the wisest and most prolific of early English lawgivers. He became an earnest Christian, and remained throughout his reign deeply attached to the intellectual life and higher culture of Western Europe. But Canute's worthless sons did not walk in their father's footsteps. In 1036, Harold Harefoot, son of Elfkifu, or Elfiva, succeeded him on the throne of England, but his reign was short and inglorious. He was ambitious and violent, and seemed more devoted to hunting than to the affairs of the state, wherefore the people, fitly enough, nicknamed him Harefoot. He died at Oxford in 1040, at the moment when his half-brother Hardicanute, son of Emma, finally arrived in England. Hardicanute was, if possible, even less qualified to occupy a throne than his worthless brother. He promised amnesty to all who had hitherto sided with Harold Harefoot, but as soon as he was crowned king he began to levy heavy taxes to pay his large army. He was harsh and narrow-minded, and lacked every kingly quality. When this unworthy son of the great King Canute suddenly died in his twenty-fifth year, in the second year of his reign, the people felt it as a riddance. He was succeeded by his half-brother, Edward the Confessor, the last surviving son of King Ethelred and Emma. According to the Treaty of Brennerne, King Magnus of Norway succeeded Hardicanute as king of Denmark. King Canute's family was now extinct in the male line, for Sven Estridsson, a son of Ulf Jarl and Canute's sister Estrid, who was the nearest heir to the throne, was unable to rally the people to his support. King Magnus Olafsson was now eighteen years old, a well-built young man with light auburn hair and noble features. He was brave, well-skilled in the use of arms, and had already gained a reputation for justice. The Danes welcomed him with unfeigned enthusiasm, mixed with a veneration accorded him as the son of the greatest saint in the north. With characteristic generosity, King Magnus made Sven Estridsson a jarl, with the understanding that he should defend the borders of Jutland against the Wends. 
He married his sister Ovid to Ordulf, son of the Duke of Saxony, and secured thereby the friendship and support of that powerful family. Magnus, who enjoyed great power and renown, claimed also the throne of England as the heir of King Hardicanut, according to the Treaty of Brennerne. The saga of Magnus the Good states that he sent the following message to King Edward the Confessor. You may have heard of the agreement which was made between King Hardicanut and myself, that the one who lived longest should inherit the lands and subjects of the other, if he died without a male heir. Now it has come to pass, as I know you have learned, that I have fallen heir to all the Danish possessions of King Hardicanut. But at the time of his death he held England no less than Denmark, and I, therefore, claim England according to the agreement made. I desire that you give up the kingdom to me, otherwise I will attack it with an army both from Denmark and Norway, and he will then govern it who wins the victory. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle shows that in 1046 an invasion from Norway was expected, and that the English fleet was stationed at Sandwich ready to defend the coast. But Sven's fight with him, i.e. with Magnus, hindered him from coming hither, says the Chronicle. Subsequent events in Denmark prove the correctness of these statements. Einar Tomberskjelver is said to have shaken his head when he heard that Magnus had made Sven Estridsson a jarl. Too powerful a jarl, was his comment. Sven was soon tempted to begin an uprising against King Magnus. He made an alliance with the Wends, against whom he was to protect the borders, and Magnus had to call out half the military forces of Norway to put down the rebellion. Sven was compelled to flee, but at any favorable moment he might renew the attack, and with so dangerous an enemy at his back, Magnus did not venture to undertake an invasion of England. The fortified city of Jomsburg was an inconvenient neighbor. So long as this independent Viking stronghold did not submit to King Magnus, it was a constant source of danger to his kingdom, and he resolutely marched against it and captured it after a spirited resistance. In the meanwhile, the Wends, who had not been held in check by Sven Estridsson, poured over the borders and committed fearful depredations in southern Jutland. Magnus gathered a large army at Hedeby, and his brother-in-law, Ordulf of Saxony, came to his assistance with a considerable force. On Michaelmas, September 29, 1043, he faced the Wendish host on Lierschog Heath, and defeated them in a most sanguinary battle. Under these circumstances, the intended invasion of England had to be abandoned, but Magnus had won great renown through his many victories. He had overcome all opposition, and the peace and security of the Danish kingdom was safely established. Everything now augured well for a prosperous and peaceful reign, but Magnus was still to learn that uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. A most formidable rival suddenly appeared to place new difficulties in his path. This was Harald Sigurdsson, a half-brother of St. Olaf, son of Osta and King Sigurd Seer. During the fifteen years which had passed since the Battle of Stiklestad, he had gained great renown as chief of the Varangians in the service of the Greek emperor at Byzantium. He had married Elizabeth, Elisiv, daughter of Grand Duke Yaroslav of Gardarike, and brought great treasures with him to Norway. Elizabeth seems to have died soon after their marriage, as Harold married Thora of the Arnmödling family shortly after his arrival in Norway. Harold was a talented leader of the old martial type, who never hesitated to make the sword the arbiter of every controversy. The sagas describe him as very tall and strong, resolute and energetic. He possessed in an eminent degree the spirit of enterprise and reckless daring which characterized the great Viking chieftains, and his military achievements in the Levant were soon extolled in a whole literature of fictitious tales, in which he is represented as the central figure in every historic event with which he was in any way connected. The saga narratives, based partly on these tales, and partly on skaldic songs which were often misunderstood, because they told of unknown and distant lands, are wholly unreliable in details. Only the more general features which are corroborated by other sources can be accepted as history. P. A. Munch has shown that the skaldic songs agree in all main features with the Byzantine writers, and that a reliable account of Harold's early career can be extracted from these sources. The correctness of Munch's position was later proven through the discovery of a document which threw new light on the subject. In 1881, Professor Vasilevsky of Moscow published a treatise on a newly discovered Greek manuscript from the 11th century, written by a contemporary of Harold Sigurdsson. The author tells us that Araltes, Harald, was a son of the king of Varangia, and that his brother Yulavos, Olaf, had made him next to himself in rank. But Araltes, who was young and had learned to admire the power of the Romans, wished to do homage to Emperor Michael Paphlagon, also called Michael Cataloctus, and came to Constantinople with 500 brave warriors. This agrees with the Heimskringla, which states that Harald had many men. The author further states that the emperor sent him to Sicily, where the Roman army was carrying on war. 
He must have served under the imperial general Georgios Maniakis, whom he aided in the conquest of Sicily, 1038 to 1040. He performed great feats of arms, says the author, and on his return the emperor gave him the title of Magdobitas. Then it happened that Delianos in Bulgaria rose in rebellion. Harold accompanied the emperor into that province and performed such deeds as befitted his rank and valor. On his return to Constantinople, the emperor conferred on him the title of Spatharo Candidatos. Harold's campaign in Bulgaria is not mentioned in the sagas, but it is referred to in a song by the skald Theodolf Arnoson. Harold was staying in Constantinople when the emperor died in December 1041, and also during the short reign of Michael Caliphatus, who was dethroned April 21, 1042. He did military service for a while also under the next emperor, Constantine Monomachus, but he sought permission to leave because he wished to return to his own country. This request was refused, but Harold made good his escape, 1043 or 1044. The author is also able to state that Harold became king in his own country after his brother Olaf, and that as king he maintained his old friendship with the Romans. From the Skaldic songs, which corroborate the statements of the author, and on many points supplement the account, we learn that Harold also took part in campaigns in Syria and Mesopotamia, and that he went to Jerusalem with a body of Varangians, probably to guard the architects and laborers sent by the emperor to erect a new church in that city. After Harold left Constantinople, he went to Grand Duke Yaroslav in Gardarike. He married Elisiv, the Grand Duke's daughter, as already stated, and after having spent some time at this court, he crossed the Baltic with a single ship and came to Sigtuna in Sweden. Here he met Sven Estridsson, who sought to persuade him to join in an attack on King Magnus. But Harold decided to try negotiations. He proceeded to Denmark and found Magnus stationed with his fleet in Øresund, the Sound, on the coast of Skane. Harold had a stately vessel, beautifully painted, with gilt dragon head and dragon's tail, and with a sail of costly material. The sudden appearance of such a ship caused no small surprise in the royal fleet, and King Magnus sent a vessel forward to hail the stranger. In answer to the inquiry of the king's messengers, a tall and stately man came forward and told them that he was sent by Harold Sigurdsson, King Magnus's uncle, to learn how he would receive him. The tall stranger was Harold Sigurdsson himself. When this news was brought the king, he immediately sent word that he would receive his uncle with open arms. Harold then landed and was received by King Magnus and all his leading men. In a few days, negotiations were begun. Harold asked if Magnus would recognize his right of succession to the throne and grant him one half of his kingdom to which Magnus replied that in such matters he would follow the advice of his chief counselors. Einar Tomborskjelver then arose and said that if Harald received half the kingdom, it was but fair that he should divide his treasures with King Magnus. But this Harald refused to do. Einar, who was ruffled by the refusal of so generous an offer, said to him, Far away you were, Harald, while we won the kingdom back from the Knutlings, King Knut and his sons, and we have no desire to be divided between chieftains. Hitherto we have served only one at a time, and so it shall be as long as King Magnus lives. I will do all in my power to prevent you from getting any part of the kingdom. Harald now returned to Sweden, where he formed an alliance with Sven Estridsson. Denmark was attacked, and Harald harried the Danish islands in true Viking fashion, as it appears, against the will of Sven, who could only gain the people's ill will through such depredations. When Magnus came with a fleet, Harald made his way to Norway, where he hoped to be proclaimed king in Magnus's absence. He first tried to win his own home districts in Oplanena, but the people remained indifferent. In Gudbrandsdal he was more successful. His powerful relative, the youthful Thore of Steig, aided him. Harald called a thing where Thore gave him the royal title, which together with the band of followers which he had gathered, gave him new prestige. When Magnus learned of Harald's whereabouts, he quickly returned to Norway, but a clash of arms was averted by the chieftains, who did not want to see two near relatives wage war against each other. A meeting was arranged and negotiations were renewed. It seems that the chieftains were determined not to divide the kingdom, and not to tolerate two kings except as joint sovereigns. An agreement was finally reached on the basis of Einar Tarnbaschgelver's earlier proposition. Harald should share the throne of Norway with Magnus, and in return he should divide his treasures with him. The joint sovereignty appears to have been limited to Norway, which was now for the first time to be ruled by two kings exercising equal authority. The kings had each their own herd, but rivalry and jealousy between their followers and adherents soon bred serious trouble. Harald, who was harsh and uncompromising, was nicknamed Hardrada, Hard Ruler, and was often contrasted in a disparaging way with the kind and generous Magnus the Good. 
The people, especially the chieftains, sided with Magnus, and Harald grew very embittered against Einar Tambarskjelver, who became the leader of an opposition to the new king, whom he regarded as a usurper. In 1047, Magnus and Harald made an expedition to Denmark, and drove out Sven Estridsson, but Magnus died suddenly in Seeland. According to Saxo Grammaticus, Sven Augustson, and Adam von Bremen, he was thrown from his horse while pursuing Sven, and received so severe an injury that he died shortly after on board his ship, 1047. Before he died, he willed the kingdom of Denmark to Sven Estridsson, whom he had learned to respect as a courageous and able prince. Magnus was highly beloved by the Norwegian people, and his death caused general mourning. He left no son to succeed him on the throne. A fortunate circumstances, perhaps, a civil strife between wild candidates was thereby averted. Harald immediately assembled all the warriors of the fleet, and announced to them that he did not want to abide by the decision of King Magnus, as he regarded Denmark as well as Norway his rightful inheritance. But the warriors refused to follow him on a campaign in Denmark until he had properly buried King Magnus. Einar Tamberskelver told him that he would rather follow Magnus dead than any other king living. With a large part of the fleet he left King Harald and set sail for Trondheim, where Magnus was interred in the St. Clement's Church by the side of his father, St. Olaf. Harald could do nothing against Denmark for the present. He went to Viken in southern Norway and assembled the Borgarthing, where he was proclaimed king of all Norway. He was also proclaimed King Magnus's successor at the Urething in Trendelagen, according to old custom, and the following year he married Thora, the daughter of Thorberg Arneson of Giska, as already mentioned. End of chapter 47「Chapter 48 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1, by Knut Gershot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reign of Harald Hardrada Olaf Tryggvason and Olaf Haraldsson had to win the throne as a prize in armed conflict with the aristocracy, but Harald Sigurdsson Hardrada became king of Norway without opposition, though he was very unpopular. Since St. Olaf's time, a complete change had taken place in the people's attitude towards the centralized power of monarchical government. Kingship was now looked upon as a fully legitimated national institution, and Harald succeeded to the throne by right of inheritance or odal, which no one ventured to challenge. There was no longer any organized opposition to the king. The aristocracy had accepted the new form of government and submitted loyally to the king's authority when it was exercised with proper moderation. They had given King Magnus their undivided support in all his undertakings, and he was very popular and highly beloved by all. But his rule had been benign, and the nobles had exercised a great influence in public affairs. During his minority, Karl Varnason had acted as regent, and later Einar Tamberskelver became his chief counselor. Magnus was not a tool in the hands of the nobles, but he listened to their advice and showed them no unnecessary effrontery. King Harald Hardrada was of a different type. He was harsh and greedy, not always conscientious as to the means which he employed, disposed to be arbitrary and to have slight regard for others. His character was of the kind that breeds discord, and quarrels with recalcitrant nobles were numerous in his reign. But he was able and ambitious, and came to the throne with the fixed purpose of making the royal power supreme in church and state, and of extending full authority over all the lands which belonged or which had belonged to the Norwegian crown. He was a most able and energetic ruler, who brooked no interference from nobles at home or from powers abroad. He loved independence as passionately as he coveted renown, and wielded the sword of state with a grim recklessness, like a soldier's broadsword to gain for himself and his kingdom the greatest possible prestige and power. From the outset he met with considerable opposition and ill-will, caused by his own greed and harshness. He was greatly chagrined by what he considered the arrogant behavior of some of the chieftains. One of the principal offenders was Einar Tamberskelver in Trindelagen, who acted as the spokesman of the people, and on more than one occasion forced the king to recede from his harsh and sometimes unjust demands. King Harald had a suspicion that many of the chieftains were carrying on secret negotiations with King Svein of Denmark. In order to test their loyalty, he engaged spies who claimed to be secret agents sent by King Svein to offer the Norwegian nobles riches and great honors if they would aid him against King Harald. When these spies came to Einar Tamberskelver, he told them that although he was not Harald's friend, 
he would do everything in his power to aid him in defending the kingdom against King Sven. The king praised Einar for his loyalty and invited him to a festive gathering in Nidaros. It now looked as if old differences would be forgotten, that peace and friendship would finally be established between them. But King Harald gave the great noble new offense, as if from pure love of mischief. The old enmity was still further aggravated, and Einar and his son Eindrida were treacherously murdered at the instigation of the king. This wanton deed caused the greatest resentment in Trondelagen, and the people threatened to rise in open rebellion. Einar's widow, Bergliot, sent word to her powerful relative, Hakon Iverson, in Oplanana, and asked him to avenge Einar's death. Harald sent Finn Arneson to Hakon, who promised to remain loyal if the king would give him Ragnhild, the daughter of Magnus, in marriage, together with a dowry suitable to her rank. This was promised him, and the threatened uprising was averted. Finn Arneson, who had been St. Olaf's special friend, and who had adhered no less faithfully to his successor, was not much better rewarded than Einar Tomberskelver. His brother Kalv, who at Finn's request had been permitted to return from his exile, accompanied Harald on an expedition against Denmark, but the king sent him against the enemy with a handful of men, and he was overpowered and slain. Finn felt so aggrieved that he abandoned both his king and his country, and went to King Sven in Denmark, who made him jarl over the Danish province of Holland, on the southwest coast of Sweden. After some time, Hakon Iverson asked King Harald to fulfill his promise of giving him Ragnhild, King Magnus's daughter, in marriage. Harald said that he had no objection, but Hakon would have to obtain the maiden's own consent. Hakon agreed to do this, but he was unsuccessful in his courtship. Ragnhild told him that although he was a handsome and noble-looking man, she, being a princess, could not marry him so long as he was only a lendermand. He then asked Harald to give him the rank of Jarl, so that he could marry Ragnhild, but this he would not do. It had been a rule, he said, ever since the time of St. Olaf, not to have more than one Jarl in the kingdom at one time. Orm Eilifsson was now Jarl, and he could not deprive him of his title and dignity. This strange answer convinced Hakon that Harald did not intend to keep his promise, and he went to King Sven in Denmark, where he was well received. He was later reconciled to King Harald and married Ragnhild, who had learned to love him, and now accepted him without interposing any conditions. Harald promised to raise him to the rank of Jarl on the death of Orm Eilifsson, but when Orm died, he again failed to keep his promise, and Hakon and Ragnhild returned to Denmark to King Sven, who invited them to stay at his court and welcomed St. Olaf's granddaughter with special fondness. Hakon was made Jarl of Holland, to succeed Finn Arneson, who had died. It is quite clear from these and other similar episodes that Harald Hardrada was bent on destroying the power of the aristocracy, and he could ill conceal his feeling of satisfaction when the powerful nobles one after another disappeared. He is even said to have stated in skaldic verse that he had caused the death of thirteen men, but who they were is not mentioned. It cannot be doubted that by pursuing such a policy of removing the old chieftains who possessed sufficient prestige to be able to offer resistance, the king gradually strengthened his own power. He possibly even gave the throne increased stability, but this practice weakened Harald in his foreign wars. It deprived him of the aid of many of the ablest men. Some left the country to use their influence in stirring up opposition to him, both at home and abroad and many who remained at home gave him but a half-hearted support. The enmity between Harold and King Sven developed into a feature of European politics, and shaped Harold's attitude in the administration of church affairs. In order to strengthen his position, Sven allied himself more closely with Archbishop Aldebert of Bremen, and with the German Emperor, while Harold continued in the old friendship with the Saxon dukes. He severed all connections with Archbishop Aldebert, received bishops from the Greek church, and maintained friendly relations with Byzantium. The Norwegian bishops were no longer consecrated by the Archbishop of Bremen, but in Rome, England, France, or in the Orient. Archbishop Aldebert protested to Pope Alexander II against Harold's flagrant disregard of the authority of the Archbishop over the Church of Norway, 
and the Pope wrote a letter reprimanding the king. Adalbert also sent messengers to Harold to protest against his course of action, and threatened him with ban and other punishments. But Harold replied, I know of no archbishop in Norway except myself, King Harold. He maintained the independence of the Church of Norway throughout his whole reign with such unbending pertinacity that he was accused of all sorts of vile practices by his angry opponents. Adam von Bremen, who stayed at the court of Archbishop Adalbert, indulges in the bitterest invectives against Harold, whom he pictures as the most cruel and unprincipled tyrant. This is not history, but the expression of acrimonious partisan spirit. Conrad Maurer quotes the following from Campbell. Every wise and powerful government has treated with deserved disregard the complaint that the spouse of Christ was in bondage. Boniface, himself an Englishman, papal beyond all his contemporaries, laments that no church is in greater bondage than the English. A noble testimony to the nationality of the institution, the common sense of the people, and the vigor of the state. The hostility existing between Harald Hardrada and King Sven seems to have led Harald to establish the city of Oslo, now incorporated in the city of Christiania, on the folded fjord in Viken. Here he would be within more easy reach of Denmark, and in better position to defend the country than if stationed in the faraway Niederbos. A new national sanctuary was established in the city to give it greater prestige, as Harald seems to have entertained the hope that Oslo might become to southern Norway what Nidaros and the shrine of St. Olaf was to Trundelagen. The saint interred in the new city was Halvard, a native of the district, and a cousin of the king. He is said to have been the son of a landed proprietor, Vebjorn, and his wife Torni, a sister of Osta, the mother of St. Olaf and King Harald Hordrada. Already in his youth he was noted for great piety and purity of life. His father was a merchant, and Halvard assisted him in his work, but he was so conscientious that he made two weights, a lighter one for weighing the part which he himself was to receive, and a heavier for weighing his brother's part. One day, as he left home to go across the Dramensfjord, a woman came running to him, beseeching him to rescue her. She was pursued by three men who claimed that she had committed theft in their brother's house. She protested her innocence, and Halvard took her into his boat and started across the lake, but the pursuers soon caught up with them. In vain he pleaded for the woman. When he refused to give her up, they killed both him and her, fastened two millstones to his body, and lowered it into the lake. Some time afterward, his body, with the millstones still fastened to it, was found floating on the lake, and twigs, which had been used in searching for the corpse, budded several times in succession. The Icelandic annals state that St. Halvard was slain in 1043, and Adam von Berman says that many miraculous cures occurred at his grave. He must, therefore, have been generally regarded as a saint at the time when Adam von Bremen wrote, about 1070, but when and in what way he was proclaimed a saint is not known. His body was probably interred in the St. Mary's Church erected by King Harold. In the 12th century, a new cathedral church, dedicated to St. Halvard, was erected at Oslo. King Harold also built a St. Mary's Church in Nidaros, in which the shrine of St. Olaf was deposited. As the city had grown and private houses were erected around the St. Clemens Church in the Royal Hall, the king selected for the new church a location farther from the center of the city. Here he also erected a new royal residence. He completed the St. Olaf's Church, which King Magnus had begun, and the unfinished royal hall from King Magnus's time was remodeled into a church dedicated to St. Gregorius. King Harold maintained the supremacy over the colonies with energy and firmness. Thorfinn, the powerful Jarl of the Orkney and Shetland Islands, who had remained independent since the death of St. Olaf, hastened to Norway as soon as he heard of the death of Magnus the Good, and was well received at the court. It must be inferred that he submitted to Harold, and that these island colonies returned to their old allegiance as dependencies under the king's overlordship. Thorfinn seems to have been the more willing to offer his submission, because King Macbeth of Scotland, with whom he was closely associated, 
was threatened by Malcolm Canmore, the son of Thorfinn's cousin, King Duncan. Thorfinn was sure to be involved in the struggle in Scotland, and he would not risk the possibility of coming into collision with King Harold. Hostilities between Macbeth and Malcolm began in 1054. Aided by his foster father, the powerful Earl Seward of Northumbria, Malcolm defeated Macbeth at Dunsinane the same year, and in 1057 Macbeth was slain in the Battle of Lumphanon. What part Thorfinn played in the struggle cannot be stated, but it is quite certain that he aided his old friend Macbeth. Thorfinn had also added the Hebrides, Sudres, to his dominions, and when he submitted to the king, they became a Norwegian dependency. Karl Varnason acted as governor in the islands till his return to Norway in Harald Hordrada's reign. The Faroe Islands remained in firm allegiance to Norway. Since Leif Asterson was made governor by King Magnus after the death of Trondigata, no attempt was again made by the colony to assert its independence. Harald also made earnest efforts to attach Iceland more closely to the crown. He sought by rich gifts to attain the goodwill of the leading men, and when a famine occurred in Iceland, he sent several shiploads of provisions. Many Icelandic skalds became his herdmen and were shown great honors. As a result of these favors, the Icelanders held Harald in high esteem, but they did not formally acknowledge themselves subject to the king of Norway. The intercourse with the colonies in Greenland was well maintained, and voyages were made every year across the Atlantic directly from Norway to Greenland. Harald refused to abide by the arrangement made by King Magnus that Sven Estridsson should receive the kingdom of Denmark, and continued to claim the Danish throne. He repeatedly harried the coasts of Denmark, but as these attacks, which seemed to have been mere raids, proved unavailing, Harald finally challenged Sven to a pitched battle. The challenge was accepted, and a naval engagement was fought off Nyssa, near the mouth of the Goethe River, on the 9th of August, 1062. Throughout the whole bright summer night, the combat raged. Harald gained the victory, but he was returned to Norway immediately afterwards, and this battle was as barren of results as former expeditions. King Anand Jakob of Sweden had died, and his successor, Steinkil Ragnvaldsson, had granted Vermland to Håkon Iverson, who had been made Jarl of Holland by King Sven. At the head of an army, Håkon entered Ringerike in southeastern Norway, and collected taxes as if he were a jarl. Hawken was popular in these districts, while Harald was disliked, because he levied excessive taxes and deprived the people of many old rights and privileges. A serious uprising seemed imminent, and Harald finally decided to make peace with Denmark, 1064. King Sven was henceforth left in undisturbed possession of the Danish throne. Harald attacked and defeated Jarl Hawken, and the uprising in Oplanena was speedily put down. End of chapter 48。Chapter 49 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Second Conquest of England. The Weak King Edward the Confessor who succeeded Hardicanut on the throne of England, was better fitted to be a monk than a king, and throughout his reign he was a tool in the hands of the powerful earls, Godwin of Wessex, Leofrich of Mercia, and Seward of Northumbria. Godwin, who was his father-in-law and the most powerful man in England, exercised for a long time almost regal powers, and his sons Svein, Harold, and Tostig were granted large possessions. Harold was a man of eminent ability, and his generosity and uprightness of character made him very popular. When his father died in 1051, he was about 31 years of age, and during the declining years of Edward the Confessor, he administrated the affairs of the realm with great wisdom and ability. His brothers, Svein and Tostig, were men of a different type, greedy and lawless ruffians, who were a constant source of strife and mischief. Sven abducted the beautiful abbess Aedgifu from a nunnery, and committed other vile deeds for which he was finally banished. Tostig, who was King Edward's favorite, was made Earl of Northumbria on the death of Earl Seward, but he seldom visited his possessions except to extort unjust taxes. The long-suffering people finally rebelled and drove him away, 
and Morkera, a grandson of Leofric, was chosen to succeed him. King Edward died on the 5th of January, 1066. As he left no son, the kingdom of England became a prize to be contended for by a number of rival candidates, all men of fame and ability, whose claims to the throne were equally clouded and uncertain. The four candidates who claimed to be the lawful heirs of the deceased king were Duke William of Normandy, Earl Harold, son of Godwin, King Sven Estridsson of Denmark, and King Harald Hardrada of Norway. King Harald claimed that King Edward had bequeathed him the kingdom. This would give him no valid title to the throne, since the king could not elect his successor. But Harald was the only native English candidate who could be considered at this critical moment, and he was chosen king by the Witenagemot, which alone possessed the right of choice. This made Harald rightful king of England, but it did not extinguish the title which the other candidates claimed to have. Duke William urged that King Edward the Confessor had promised him the throne of England. He also maintained that Harold had sworn fealty to him, and had solemnly promised to support his claim. Harold had been shipwrecked on the coast of Ponthieu in France some years before. The count of that district took him prisoner, and turned him over to Duke William of Normandy, and he was forced to give William the stated pledges to obtain his liberty. Neither of these reasons gave Duke William any right to the throne of England, as neither King Edward nor Earl Harold could give away the kingdom, but what he needed was a fair pretext. For the rest he trusted to his valiant sword. Sven Estridsson of Denmark claimed the English throne as the heir of his cousin King Hardicanute, and of his uncle King Canute the Great. Harald Hardrada of Norway based his claim on the Treaty of Brennerna, by which Hardicanute made Magnus the Good his heir. This was, in a way, the same claim which Magnus himself had urged against Edward the Confessor, but it had been reduced to an empty pretense since Magnus on his deathbed had surrendered Denmark to Sven Estridsson. The plotting Earl Tostig had negotiated with all the three foreign pretenders, and stood ready to sell his support to the highest bidder. As soon as rumor got abroad that Harold had been crowned at London, January 6, 1066, Duke William of Normandy sent messengers to remind him of his promise, and began active preparations for an invasion of England. He mustered all his barons, and induced a great number of knights from Anjou, Brittany, Poitou, Flanders, and other places to join in the enterprise by offering them lands and treasures. He had prevailed on Pope Alexander II to issue a bull approving of the expedition, and ships were built to carry the army across the English Channel. According to William of Aquitaine, he also sent an embassy to Sven Astridsen to solicit his aid. This must have been Tostig, who, according to the sagas, went to King Sven as soon as his brother Harald was crowned king, to induce him to invade England. Sven did not venture upon such an undertaking, and Tostig then turned to King Harald Hardrada of Norway without any authority from Duke William. Harald is said to have promised to send an expedition to England in the summer, and Tostig promised to aid him with all the forces which he could gather. When the conquest was completed, he was to be made jarl over one half of England as King Harald Hardrada's vassal. But Tostig, who was as impatient as he was unreliable, hastened to Flanders, and before either Duke William or King Harald were ready to set sail, he gathered a fleet of sixty vessels, manned partly by his own adherents, partly by adventurers and freebooters of all sorts, and made an attack on the southern coast of England. King Harald came against him with a large fleet and army, and he fled northward, and entered the Humber, where his fleet was destroyed by Earl Edwin of Mercia. With twelve ships he reached Scotland, where he was harbored by King Malcolm III. In the summer of 1066, Harold Hardrada was busy making preparations for his expedition to England. He had chosen the Solund Islands on the coast of Sagan, in southwestern Norway, as the rendezvous for his fleet, and by the beginning of September he had gathered a large armament of 250 war vessels and about 20,000 men. Before his departure he made his eldest son, Magnus, regent, and caused him to be crowned king. His younger son, Olaf, accompanied him on the expedition. He sailed first to the Shetland Islands, and thence to the Orkneys. The Orkney Jarls, Paul and Erland, had to join the expedition with a large number of ships and troops. 
When he reached the Tyne in Scotland about the 10th of September, he was also joined by Tostig, who acknowledged him as his lord. They landed at various places along the coast, captured Scarborough after some resistance, and took possession of the coast districts as far as the Humber. The fleet ascended the Humber and the Ouse, but came to anchor at Recall, eight miles south of York. Here Harold landed his army and marched along the river toward the city. The earls Morgara of Northumbria and Edwin of Mercia, who had gathered a large army in York, came out to meet Harold at Fulford, about two miles from the city. A bloody battle was fought, in which the earls suffered a crushing defeat. The remnants of their army fled back to York, while Harold took possession of the neighboring district, and entrenched himself at Stamford Bridge on the Derwent River. The city of York offered to capitulate, and on September 24th Harold advanced with his army to meet the citizens outside the city, where the terms of peace were arranged. They acknowledged him their lord, promised to supply him with provisions, and agreed to give five hundred hostages. In the evening Harold returned to his fleet, but planned to advance on the following morning to Stamford Bridge, where the hostages were to be delivered. In the meantime, Harold Godwinson had arrived at York with his army, and had been watching Harold's movements. In the night he was secretly admitted into the city. The next morning Harold advanced with a part of his army. The other part was left in charge of his son Olaf and the Orkney Jarls Paul and Erlen to guard the fleet. The day was warm, and as no hostilities were anticipated, the men marched without their brinnies. When they arrived at Stamford Bridge, Harold suddenly fell upon them with his whole force. The saga says that Harold did not follow Tostig's advice to retreat to the ships, but sent messengers to bring the rest of the army to his support. This was a fatal mistake. Before help arrived, Harold's forces were overwhelmed and defeated, and he was mortally wounded in the fight. The Heimskring law gives a vivid description of the Battle of Stamford Bridge. It tells how Harold, when he found himself face to face with the whole English army, planted his banner, formed a shield ring, and made ready for the combat. But before the battle began, a horseman rode up, spoke to Earl Tostig, and offered him the earldom of Northumbria if he would join the English. Tostig asked how much he would give Harold Sigurdsson, the Norwegian king. The horseman said that he would gladly give him six feet of ground, and as much more as he was taller than other men. But Tostig rejected the offer, says the saga. When the horseman rode away, they discovered that it was King Harold Godwinson himself. The fight commenced, and the Norsemen in their shield ring resisted stoutly the attack of the English cavalry. But when they thought that the attack had failed, and that the English began to retreat, they rushed eagerly forward in pursuit. The shield ring was broken, and they were attacked from all sides. A fearful carnage resulted. King Harold rushed into the midst of the fray, but an arrow pierced his throat, and he fell mortally wounded. Tostig now assumed command. Supported by the reinforcements which arrived from the fleet, he rallied the broken columns to renewed efforts, but the men had become exhausted on the forced march from the fleet. Towards evening the Norse army broke and fled in wild disorder, and darkness alone saved the broken remnants from destruction. This dramatic description of the battle is manifestly erroneous. The English are represented as fighting on horseback, though we know that their army was very deficient in cavalry. The English were foot soldiers, as we see from the Battle of Hastings, which occurred less than three weeks later. The saga writer seems to have confused the Battle of Stamford Bridge with that of Hastings, where the Norman mounted knights made repeated attacks on the English foot soldiers, who stood firm behind their shield wall until, by a feint, they were led to pursue the enemy and suffered a crushing defeat. The cavalry fight in the Battle of Stamford Bridge is not mentioned in the older Norse sources, nor in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. We are left completely in the dark, therefore, as to the details of the battle. We only know that at Stamford Bridge, King Harald Hordrada suffered an overwhelming defeat. There, King Harald of Norway and Earl Tostig were slain, says the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and a great number of men with them, both Norsemen and English. The chronicle states that Harold Godwinson suffered Harold's son Olaf and the Orkney Jarls to depart with twenty-four ships and the remnant of the army. We may well doubt the accuracy of the statement that only twenty-four ships left. Olaf and the Jarls, who were in charge of the fleet, 
had both time and opportunity to hold the ships in readiness as they knew that a battle was in progress. That the whole large army of 30,000 men should be so utterly destroyed that only 24 ships could be manned seems quite incredible. The statement in the Heimskring law that Harold let Olaf depart with the fleet and the remnant of the army seems more worthy of belief. Harold had no time to waste. On September 28th, three days after the Battle of Stamford Bridge, Duke William landed at Pevensey, in southern England, with 60,000 men, and on the 6th or 7th of October, Harold was again in London making preparations for the still greater battle fought at Hastings, October 14th, 1066. In this hard-fought battle, Harold Godwinson fell, and William the Conqueror became King of England. The defeat and death of the warlike Harold Hardrada changed the political situation in the north. Sven Estridsson of Denmark felt that all danger of an attack from Norway was now removed, and as he considered his claim to the throne of England as valid as ever, he resolved to invade England and expel King William. Many Danes who had been banished from England, or had suffered other wrongs, were also urging him to assert his claim. But the preparations proceeded very slowly, and three years passed before the expedition was finally ready to start. In the month of August, 1069, 240 ships set sail for England, led by Sven's brother Asbjorn, his sons Harold and Knut, and Jarl Thorkil. After attacking Dover, Sandwich, and Norwich without success, the fleet entered the Humber and advanced towards York. Northern England, where the Viking element still was strong, had not submitted to King William. The boy Aidgar the Etheling, grandson of Edmund Ironside, was chosen king when Harold fell at Hastings, but he had fled to Scotland after the battle. He was now in Northumbria, where the earls Morcair and Edwin were aiding him in organizing a great revolt against William. The arrival of the Danish fleet in the Humber became the signal for a general uprising. York was taken by the combined forces of the Danes and Northumbrians, but the Norman garrison burned the city before surrendering, and the victors leveled the fortifications with the ground. When King William arrived, the Danes retreated to their ships, and the Northumbrians returned to their homes, but as soon as he departed, the attack was renewed. William was unable to assail the Danish fleet for want of ships, but he succeeded in bribing the Danish commander, Asbjorn, to remain inactive, and finally to depart from England. On northern England he wrecked a fearful vengeance, wasting it with fire and sword. No such devastation had ever passed over an English community as that wrought by William the Conqueror in Northumbria. The prosperity of this flourishing district was wiped out, and its spirit and power of resistance was broken. Osbjorn returned to Denmark with his ships laden with booty, but the enterprise had failed and his own conduct had been reprehensible. In 1075, another Danish fleet of 200 vessels, led by Sven's son Knut and Jarl Hagen, again visited England and entered the Humber, but not a hand was raised to aid or welcome them, and they returned home after collecting some booty in the neighborhood of York. This was the last Viking expedition to England. End of chapter 49「Olaf, Harald's son, spent the winter of 1066 to 1067 in the Orkneys, and returned to Norway in the spring. His brother Magnus had been crowned king before the expedition left for England, but Olaf was also made king on his return. The Heimskringla says that they were made joint kings, but Magnus was to rule the northern and Olaf the southern half of the country. The loss of the great army sent to England was a severe blow, nothing less than a national calamity. The country's resources were badly drained, and the available stores and military forces were gone. Under these circumstances, King Sven of Denmark found the time opportune to put forward a claim to overlordship over Norway. Magnus and Olaf refused to listen to these demands, and he gathered a fleet and prepared to invade the country. This he could now do without violating any agreement, since the treaty of peace concluded between him and King Harald in 1064 should remain in force only so long as the king who lived. Hostilities commenced, 
but the peace-loving Olaf began negotiations with King Svein, which resulted in a new treaty of peace between Norway and Denmark in 1068. This treaty should be binding for all times, and neither kingdom should claim supremacy over the other. King Magnus, who had been sickly for some time, died in 1069, and Olaf became king of all Norway. The Heimskringla describes him as follows. Olaf was a large man and well built. It is a common opinion that no one has seen a man better looking or of nobler appearance. His yellow, silky hair fell in rich locks. He had fair skin, beautiful eyes, and well-proportioned limbs. He was generally reticent and spoke little at the thing, but he was glad and talkative at the drinking feast. He drank much and was cheerful and peace-loving to the end of his days. Because of his quiet disposition and peaceful reign, he was called Olaf Kyrre, the quiet. His efforts to maintain peace at home and abroad had a most beneficent effect at this time, not only because the kingdom needed to recover from the heavy losses incurred in the fruitless military exploits of his martial father, but also because the people's mind needed to be turned away from the strut and vainglory which usually attends war and adventure, to seek employment and honor in peaceful pursuits. Conditions in the neighboring kingdoms were also favorable to the maintenance of peace. As both Denmark and Sweden were so occupied with internal strife or foreign conquests that they could not pursue any aggressive policy in their relations with Norway. Christianity had not been firmly established in Sweden, and many people were displeased because of King Stenkil's efforts to promote the missionary work. The violent reaction against the church which occurred when he died in 1067 was caused perhaps in part by the overzealous Bishop Egino of Skåne, who had threatened to destroy the great heathen temple at Uppsala. Many people returned to their old faith and sacrificed to the heathen gods. Several rival candidates were also contending for the throne, and the country was torn by civil strife for many years, until Inge Stenkelsen finally overpowered his rivals and succeeded his father on the throne. In Denmark, King Sven was engaged in preparing his great expeditions to England, which brought him only loss and disappointment. When he died in 1076, his son Harald became his successor, but he soon died, and a younger brother, Knut, became king of Denmark. He was an ambitious and warlike young man, who could not forget that his ancestors had occupied the throne of England. Not discouraged by his father's fruitless attempts at conquest, he determined to send a new expedition to England. He was a great friend of Olaf Kyrre and solicited his aid for the undertaking. Olaf refused to join the expedition, but as a good friend he placed sixty warships fully manned at his disposal. In 1084, Canute began to collect a large fleet, but time passed, and when the preparations finally were near completion, most of the Danish chieftains grew impatient and returned to their homes. Norway was thereby saved from renewed hostilities with England. King Canute, who thus suddenly found himself deserted, was very wroth. He began to rule harshly and collected unjust and excessive taxes. This produced a general rebellion, and he was killed by an angry mob in St. Albans Church in Odense, where he had sought refuge. In the reign of his successor, Olav Hunger, he was declared holy, and he soon became the national saint of Denmark, though his only merit seems to have been that he was slain in a church. Olav Kira, who was pious as well as peaceful, was deeply interested in the labors of the clergy, and worked zealously throughout his long reign to give the Church of Norway a more stable and efficient organization. The defiant attitude which his father Harald Hordrada had assumed over against the Archbishop of Bremen he seems to have regarded as improper, if not unfortunate. His own disposition, as well as his friendly relations with Denmark, which was a part of the Archdiocese of Bremen, inclined him to favor the archbishop and to uphold his authority over the Norwegian clergy. He was also encouraged in his loyalty to the Roman See and its representative, the archbishop, by the pope himself, who in his letters to the king expressed a deep solicitude for the church in the north. The powerful Gregory the Seventh, who occupied the papal throne at this time, 1073 to 1085, was the real founder of the papal power and the organizer of the Roman hierarchy. The constant strife between ruling princes, the violence and turmoil everywhere rampant, convinced him that the church alone possessed the wisdom and authority to maintain peace, and to act as arbiter in every controversy. 
He wished to reform the world by organizing a universal religious monarchy with the Pope as supreme ruler. Human pride, he wrote, has created the power of kings. God's mercy has created the power of bishops. The Pope is the master of the emperors. He is rendered holy by the merits of his predecessor, St. Peter. The Roman Church has never erred, and Holy Scripture proves that it can never err. To resist it is to resist God. The growing power of the hierarchy, and the increased devotion to the Roman Church, which was the result of Pope Gregory's activity, was fast ripening into the great religious movement which culminated in the Crusades, the impulse of which was felt in every land in Western Europe. Cathedrals were built, and crusading missionary work was carried on with zeal, while all nations were drawn closer to Rome, which was the center of religious and intellectual life. That Olav Kyrre was imbued with the spirit of the age is rendered evident by his labors to organize the Church of Norway according to the general plan of the Catholic Church in other countries, as well as by his efforts to introduce in Norway the culture and refinement of the aristocratic circles in England and continental Europe. His reign marks a final victory of medieval ideas, which found their best expression in crusades and knight errantry. But the Roman incubus, which was so potent in controlling the governments, and in shaping the intellectual life of the age, was far less marked in Norway than elsewhere in Europe. Celibacy of priests, which the Pope now enforced as a part of the Roman church discipline, was not introduced in Norway. The clergy remained subject to the king, who exercised firm control in ecclesiastical affairs. The skaldic poetry flourished, the national saga literature and history writing were yet to blossom forth, and there were but scant traces of a religious literature fostered under the influence of the church. The separation of the north from the archdiocese of Bremen gave the Norwegian people a new opportunity to preserve their independence in church affairs, and to develop a strong national spirit. The attempt of Pope Gregory VII to assert his supremacy over the German emperor precipitated the famous struggle between the Pope and Emperor Henry IV, which divided the whole empire into the warring factions of Welfs and Ghibellines, friends of the Pope and supporters of the Emperor. Archbishop Aldebert of Bremen was one of the Emperor's staunchest supporters. His successor, Limar, also adhered to the Ghibelline party, even after the Emperor had been excommunicated, and Pope Gregory VII punished the disobedient prelate by depriving him of his office. King Sven Estridsson of Denmark and his successors were adherents of the Pope, and this finally led to the separation of the Scandinavian countries from the Bremen archdiocese, and the creation of a new archbishopric in the Danish city of Lund in Skåne in 1104. During this period of strife, which paralyzed the power of the Archbishop of Bremen, the highest ecclesiastical authority in Norway was exercised by the king. The state church principle, which had been practiced by St. Olaf, and which had been so imperiously maintained by Harald Hardrada, was now further strengthened by circumstances which made the king the natural leader of the Church of Norway. King Olaf Kyrre divided Norway into three bishoprics, Nidaros, Selja, and Oslo, each with its diocesan bishop, who received the rank of Jarl. New incumbents were chosen by the chapters of the diocese, but they had to present themselves before the king, who in reality selected the candidates. Each diocese had its own saint. Nidaros St. Olaf, Oslo St. Halvard, and Celia St. Suniva. In Trondheim, Olaf erected a cathedral church on the spot where St. Olaf was thought to have been buried the first time. It was dedicated to the Trinity, but was generally called the Christ Church. The altar was placed on the spot where St. Olaf's body was supposed to have rested, and the shrine of the saint was moved to the new church. On the foundations of this church, the Trondheim Cathedral was later erected. King Harald Hardrada's body, which had been brought back to Norway, was interred in St. Mary's Church, which he had built. On the west coast of Norway, Olaf Kyrre founded the city of Bergen, Old Norse Bjørkven, which, because of its favorable location, soon became one of the chief commercial towns in the north. The bishop of the diocese was to reside here, and the king began the erection of a large cathedral of stone, the Christ Church. This was finished in 1170, and the St. Seneva relics were then transferred from Celia to Bergen. In the Orkneys, Jarl Thorfinn founded a bishopric and built a cathedral church at Bergsall, 1050 to 1064. In Iceland, Gisor Islifsson, who became bishop in 1081, erected a cathedral on his estate, Skalholt, 
which he donated to the church as a permanent bishop's residence. The long period of peace during the reign of Olaf Kyrre produced a marked improvement in economic conditions. The cities grew and commerce increased. No extra taxes were imposed for military purposes, and good harvests seemed to have added to the general prosperity. It is evident from the saga accounts that this reign was long remembered as a sort of golden age of peace and plenty. In the reign of Olaf Kyrre there were good harvests and such abundant good fortune that Norway had never been more prosperous under any king since the days of Harald Harfagre, says the saga. Under these circumstances, a taste for luxury and comfort was naturally developed, and the king labored earnestly to bring the civilization and culture of his people into full harmony with the Christian spirit, and to introduce in Norway the elegance and courtly manners which were being developed everywhere in Europe during this age of chivalry. The herd was doubled in number, so that it consisted of twenty herdmaind, sixty gester, and sixty huskarlar. The herdmaind were divided into groups, at the head of which stood Skultilsfeiner, or officers of the king's guard. After the creation of this new office, the lendermen do not seem to have sought the king's herd as before, but they held now the highest rank in the country, as King Olaf did not appoint any jarls after the death of Hawken Iverson. The Kurtisfeiner, corresponding to the French pages, waited at the king's table. Behind each guest at the table stood a Curtis Fein, with a burning candle. The people of the higher classes began to wear costumes of foreign pattern, borrowed especially from England and Normandy. The people began to dress with great splendor according to foreign fashions, says the saga. They wore fine hose ruffled about the knee. Some put gold rings about the legs. Many wore long mantles with slit sides tied with ribbons and with sleeves five ells long, and so narrow that they had to be pulled on with a cord, and arranged in folds up to the shoulders. They wore high shoes, embroidered with silk and even ornamented with gold. From the upper classes, who were in sympathy with the spirit and higher culture of the age, the new tastes and ideas were soon communicated to the common people, who through a natural instinct for imitation, gradually adopted as much of the new customs as environment and circumstances would permit. King Olaf also introduced many improvements in the construction of dwelling houses. Hitherto the fireplace, Arin, was placed in the center of the house, and the smoke escaped through an opening in the roof, the Ljori. Olaf built houses with stone floors and introduced the oven, which was erected in the corner of the room with a flue for carrying away the smoke. The Ljori disappeared, and the houses received a loft, the beginning of a second story. Windows became more common, though glass windows seem yet to have been limited to the king's own dwellings. From the earliest times, the Norsemen took great delight in social and religious festivities. Their great hospitality and the liberal entertainment of friends and travelers have already been mentioned as a conspicuous national trait. The period of prosperity and peace in the time of Olaf Kyrre gave new stimulus to the development of social life. Permanent clubs or guilds, Norse gilda, Old Norse gildi, organized under the protection of the church, were instituted by King Olaf to afford better opportunity for social intercourse. These guilds had their own guild halls, women were also members, the rules were strict, and much attention was paid to fine manners and good conversation. Christian spirit was also fostered in the guilds, as they were placed under the supervision of the church. The members were mutually pledged to assist one another in times of need, a very fortunate arrangement at a time when municipal government was yet in its infancy. Thereby the guilds became the forerunners of political clubs, insurance companies, pension funds, and like organizations which have sprung from the feeling of social interdependence. The members were jointly responsible for each other's houses and stables. If a member suffered loss of house or stable by fire, the guild would rebuild it. If a man's granary burned, he received a certain amount of grain. If he lost three head of cattle or more, each member should give him a measure of grain. If the member was a merchant and lost his goods by shipwreck, he also received a compensation. If a member was imprisoned in a foreign land, he was ransomed by the guild. If he was slain by one who did not belong to the guild, the other members would assist in prosecuting the slayer but if a member committed murder, he was expelled from the guild and was not again allowed to appear in the guild hall. 
When a member died, all the other members were present at the funeral. The guilds were generally named after patron saints, under whose special protection they were supposed to stand. In Bergen they were especially numerous, and the names of many are still familiar in that city. The most important was the St. Jotmunds, St. Edmunds, guild, to which, according to an old writer, even kings, dukes, counts, barons, knights, and other noblemen belonged. In Trondheim, the oldest was the Mikle guild, the great guild, organized by Olaf Kyrre, and dedicated to St. Olaf. Tunsberg had the St. Olaf's guild and the St. Anna's guild, Oslo the guild of the holy body, St. Anna's guild, and the shoemaker's guild. The country districts, too, had their guilds. They are mentioned as having existed in Salten, Olin, Opdal, Medellin, and Hero, in Sundmar, and in many other places. That many guilds existed of which no records have been preserved can be seen from place names like Gildeskola, Gildehus, Gildevon, Gildevold, Gildesocker, etc. In course of time, when the cities became industrial centers, the guilds very naturally developed into craft guilds, in which men of the same profession or handicraft were associated together. But in Norway the guilds were controlled by the king and the church, and at no time did they become independent political organizations hostile to the ruler, something which happened not infrequently in some countries of Europe. Among the more prominent men in Norway in Olaf Kyrre's time may be mentioned especially Skule Kongsfoster, the king's chief advisor, a man of high rank, who had followed him from England. He seems to have been the king's foster father, not the son of Earl Tostig, as some sources have it. Skule was placed at the head of the herd, and he was also sent to England to bring back the body of King Harald Hordrada. The king gave him the old royal hall in Oslo, when a new royal dwelling was erected, and he granted him also a number of estates at Oslo, Konghella, and Trondheim, and also Rhine in Nordmer, from which his descendants derived their name. From Skule Kongsfostra descended Duke Skule, Skule Jarl, famous in the reign of King Haakon Haakonsson. Dag Arlifsson, the father of Gregorius Dagsson. In Viken, Sigurd Ulstreng in Trondelagen, the son of Rut af Fegen, who fell at Stiklestad. Thor of Steig in Oplenena, who was the king's secret opponent, and Svanke Steinersson, who ruled the border districts on the Goethe River were among the most powerful men in the kingdom at this time. King Olaf Kyrre died in 1093, in the 27th year of his reign. End of chapter 50